and uh, who was a biologist and chemist, and also he had learned some. So he actually thought at that time, while he was writing his 1913 paper, he thought that he could extend his reasoning to molecules. And what I show you from a paper that was published in 2005 is a page from some notes that a model that Niels Bohr put into a manuscript that was never published about his ideas for molecules. So here is, here is Niels Bohr's idea for H2 molecule. He put two electrons, remember the Bohr model had an orbit, which was circular orbits. He put them in a circular orbit around the center of the molecule. H2O, he actually knew that water was bent, but he um, put that he put the inner core electrons of the oxygen in an orbit around the oxygen nucleus. And then he put two electrons for the OH bonds, the center of the OH bonds. O2 gave him some trouble. It gave valence bond theory troubles too. O3, he actually drew for O3 what we would today call two resonance structures. A double bond here with four electrons shared with these two oxygens and two electrons shared between these two. And then he drew a double three electron bond. These are all anticipating valence bond structures. He even knew that methane was tetrahedral. You see here his attempt to draw a tetrahedral methane and with two CH bonds and acetylene too. Uh, so this is, this is pretty incredible. It's, it's sort of fun to see this. Uh, this is, we could have had this, but we didn't. Okay, back to ML theory. Two orbitals interacting, chi one and chi two. This is simple ML theory. Uh, they interact with each other. If you like, this is perturbation theory at work. They mix with each other and you get resultant wave functions, psi one, which is, has mostly chi one on the left and mixes in some of chi two on the right in a bonding way. Shading means plus, no shading means minus. Okay, do I have to tell you why I don't use plus and minus? The reason that I wanted to do that, I don't yes, use plus minus, is that I, I want you to understand that the absolute phase of the wave function is unimportant. It's the relative phase. So when you see shading, that can mean plus on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and mm -hmm. on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, it means minus and is an imaginary number on, on Sunday. Um, so it doesn't matter. A bonding orbital is bonding because plus goes with plus or minus with minus, doesn't matter. And an anti-bonding orbital, the high one is plus with minus or minus with plus. Um, okay, two levels interacting, mixing interaction. Uh, somehow how to quantify the bonding that comes. And now it matters how many electrons you put in there, because if you put two electrons in, that's a lower left here, uh, then you have bonding overall. But if you put four electrons in, that's a model for helium two, for instance, uh, then you get net anti-bonding, because as it happens, the higher combination goes up more than the lower combination once the overlap is included. Anyway, these are how to quantify that bonding. Now, you can do more complicated things. Here is what we do with high school students at a good high school, Liceo in, uh, in Brazil or the United States 
for a diatomic molecule, but uh, if not at the university, um, you interact, let's say you're building two a nitrogen molecule for two nitrogen atoms, you interact the 2S and 2P, you get in-phase and out-of-phase combinations for the uh, two Ps, there is a sigma interaction. You judge that the sigma overlap is bigger than the pi. This is where the carbon silicon stories differ a little bit. Um, the, uh, so that splitting is more here, more interaction, whereas the pi splitting is less, a little bit less. And here are the orbitals at the zeroth level. Now, now this is high school and beginning university. This is a graduate course in quantum mechanics, quantum chemistry, because what you have at left is just the beginning. What you have done, let me say it technically for those of you who are aware, what I've done at left is done zeroth ordered degenerate perturbation theory. Degenerate because S is degenerate with S and P degenerate with P. Zeroth order because when you do perturbation theory, what you do first is set up little two by two or six by six matrices for the degenerate orbitals and you prepare the orbitals for the perturbation by diagonalizing those matrices. But then in the next stage, what you do is you turn on other interactions. This is really zero thought of perturbation theory. Uh, and the, ne the next interaction is that this sigma G here, there is another sigma G right above it. Look at that. And this sigma U here has another sigma U up above it. The pi orbitals are just fine like they are but the sigma orbitals have other orbitals. And one of the rules of perturbation theory is, reduced to simple words, is if anything can mix, it will. It's just a question of how much. How much depends on overlap and inversely by the difference in an on the difference in energy between the interacting orbitals. So two orbitals which are close to each other interact more than two orbitals that are far apart from each other. And so, and there's over. So this orbital here mixes with the one above it, two sigma g. They're of the same symmetry, they can interact. They don't interact with sigma u orbitals. Those are different symmetry. That's where symmetry. <sighs> symmetry is usually rationalized to our students as being worth studying because how elegant and simple it is. But really there is a much more basic human uh, emotion that should be behind learning group theory, and that is laziness. Anything that you can do with group theory, you can do without group theory with more work. So when I tell you that sigma G does not interact with sigma U, supposing you don't believe me, so you calculate the overlap integral and you'd find it's zero. Symmetry tells you it's zero right away. Okay. Anyway, these two sigma G orbitals interact to give a stronger bond and a lone pair combination, pointing out. You cannot make two strong bonds out of two orbitals interacting. If one goes up, the other one, if one goes down, the other one goes up. Similarly, the, this, the, the sigma u here, sorry, I said this interacts with this one. I, I said it wrong. Let me start again. The sigma g on the left and the sigma g on the right interact to give the one sigma g and two sigma g on the right. The sigma u here interacts with its partner way up to give one combination here and one here. And this is the way that in MO theory, if you go to second order in the interactions, that's what we're doing. 
we're doing second order interaction. Uh, what you get is not the simplistic picture at the left, but you get bonds and lone pairs out. That's very chemical, very chemical. And that's why it's important to do this. Okay, how to analyze the amount of bonding. And I, I look at these MLs. The next thing I want is some measure of the bonding in these. Okay, this is the ones that left, it's clear. That's bonding, that's anti-bonding, bonding, bonding uh, and so on. That world is too simplistic a world. It's the high school world. Uh, we'll talk again about teaching. The real world has, this is a very bonding orbital. This is a slightly anti-bonding orbital. This is a bonding orbital. This is a slightly bonding orbital and so on. I wanna quantify if I have a method, these things. So Mulliken faced this and devised a bond index. So what we're talking about is strengths of bonds as measured from calculations. And the generic word I will use are bond indices. There are various kinds of bond indices. They just indicate quantitative. So Mulliken did it this way. He said, if you have a bond, if you have two orbitals, which makes, the orbital has to be normalized. Any self-respecting MO has to be normalized. So if the orbitals are individually normalized, the integral phi one squared is just one. The integral phi two squared by itself is one. So this comes out to be, if you take one, the normalization of the MO, it's C1 squared plus C2 squared plus two, C1, C2. Integral of phi one, phi two. Integral phi one, phi two means the overlap integral between these two. So obviously if there is no bonding, um, obviously this last thing has something to do with the bonding. And these two don't. They're individual to the atoms at least in a simple picture. So he decided to call an overlap population 2C1C2SO2. So, so what do you want a bond index to be? So here, even without starting out, what you want a bond index to be is positive when there is a bond, negative when there is anti-bonding, and zero when there isn't much bonding. The demands are not great, but you they're at least that, okay? So if you have both of these positive and the overlap is positive and large, then you have bonding. If your electrons were instead in this orbital at the top, that would be a plus times a minus and the overlap would be positive still. So plus times minus times plus would give a minus. So that would give you a negative index. And so this bond index of Mulliken called an overlap population is large if you have large coefficients. That means a lot of mixing. And you must have overlap. Why is that important? Here is here is something that no chemist would imagine would have a large contribution to a bond strength. Even though the coefficients are large, take the combinations that you are forced to take of the 1s orbitals on carbon of in ethane. The 1s orbitals on carbon are 400 eV below ionization. They are very tight around the carbon. They have, but what, yet when you form MOs of the 1s's, this is not chemistry. This is not valence orbitals. This is inner cores. If you form the plus and the minus of the core, you have equal coefficients, but the overlap between the cores 
is zero, close to zero because they're so tight. So this is not a bad bond index, but it has some problems. We, we realize that right away, Mulliken realized it. And people have devised other bond indices. Just the fact that you in the literature, when you read papers, can see that some people use Weiberg bond indices, Meyer or Levdeen ones. What that tells you is that no one can agree on what is the best bond index. That's what it tells you, that they give it different names. Of course, everyone is, has its advantages and disadvantages. These bond index values are not one, two, three. So go back to this. In the world, which is the high school world, the bond index for this low, two electrons lower MO is one, for this one is minus one, for this one, one, one for each of the two electrons. But the real ones are something like zero point, uh, something like uh, bigger than one for this one, less than one for this one and so on. So they're not exactly what the chemists want them to be, but they're there. You can still, um, you can still, um, I don't have time to tell you about this. It's an interesting story. I'll just show you the structure. I can, the beauty of chemistry is the molecules we make. So I cannot pass up a structure to show you, even though the bonding analysis is tight. So here is a set of compounds which are two golds, a metal, and two phosphates, with a metal being lead, thallium, or mercury, made by Eschen and Yajko. And the structures are with phosphorus with small black circles. The large black circles with the numbers are golds, and the white circles here are lead, thallium, or mercury. So now just look overall at the structure, what you see are approximate cubes of phosphorus and lead, I'm oh, sorry, of phosphorus and gold atoms around a line of lead, thallium, or mercury running through it like a needle. I didn't tell you the distances, but remember I'm a consumer of Cambridge Structural Database. The distances are 320, 319, 316. Those look rather large, but actually a mercury, mercury distance in metallic mercury is, um, uh, is not much larger than that. Uh, so that these are actually, and thallium and lead, those are big atoms, mercury, thallium and lead. These are distances are in a range of weak bonds. So let me now translate this into English, which turns out to be the same as Portuguese here. In these structures, there are quasi one dimensional needles of lead, thallium, or mercury. That's pretty interesting. We're always interested in one dimensional solids and they are there, they're running through this and the distances indicate partial bonding. And there's a difference of course, between lead, thallium and mercury. There's a difference of, of uh, these are, I've forgotten what the principal quantum number, but the lead has four valence electrons, thallium three and mercury two. So these are not only they're the same structure by different electron count. When I see that, I sit up. The same structure, but different electron count. That's like nature. That's like PV equals NRT. And here is nature allowing me just to vary V or just allow it to vary. It's, it's varying one parameter and I can, I'm interested in that. Okay, I'm going to leave that for now and leave it for you. Um, let's talk about atoms and molecules. 
This has been a popular way, popularized by Richard Bader, who was who started out as an organic chemist, but then turned out uh, to be a superb theoretician, did many important things, and he's written about this wide, widely. And what it has to do with is, by now you've forgotten, but BF3, when you Remember the electron density in that? I want to remind you that the electron density was a minimum along the bond line, but a maximum in two directions perpendicular to the bond line. So that's what's called uh, minus one, one, one. It's a critical point of a certain type. And when you plot the electron density, and then you plot the electron density in a certain plane, and then you plot out the gradient of the electron density. I don't have the electron. Here it is, here. I remember the red lines are the electron density for this molecule? Okay. The blue lines are the gradient. The gradient is a the derivative of the electron density. It's nothing fancy, it's just the derivative. It has a direction, but here are contours of the gradient. It turns out that the contours of the gradient terminate at atoms and then go to zero at a unique line, a unique surface, which here appears as a line in this two-dimensional cut, but it's really a surface. And that electron density, the, the gradient, that means how it changes, is such that this point, that there is a point in between the B and the F, which is a minimum with respect this is the, the arrows indicate the direction of the gradient that it's increasing in that direction. Okay, so it's increasing. the The thing is as a zero here, and then it increases the electron density toward not the zero; it's a finite value toward the atoms, and it decreases in a perpendicular direction. Richard Bader called the existence of such points, the, this called this line that comes between atoms. He called this a bond critical point. And he, these basins, which are defined by the surfaces of zero gradient, he called atomic basins. It divides space into all basins, but I want you to see right away here. So and now let me now backtrack a little bit. This was an experimental electron density. You can do this analysis on an experimental one. You can do it on a theoretical one. The world of the mo is divided into basins, which are defined by these dark lines. What you're seeing is a line because you've take, we've taken a two-dimensional cut. That line is actually a surface in three dimensions. So the carbon atom here is not a little ball. Yes, the inner core is a little ball around carbon, but not the carbon atom of the quantum theory atoms molecule. Carbon atom quantum theory atom molecules is a piece of space that goes out to infinity that is there. And that carbon atom here, however, is a piece of which is in some weird area that looks in no way like a sphere. So the basins don't look like the space filling model building blocks of atoms, but it's okay. 
they don't have to look the way your prejudices are. The hydrogens are going out to infinity too. Uh, weird, uh, but okay. But in along the line between each of the atoms, there is a line where the density, the gradient goes to, to, to zero here. The density decreases along that line and perpendicular to that line, the density increases. These define the basins, they define charges also, and they define something like, which he calls bond critical points. These are the bond critical points. Those are the points, which is the minimum of the electron density, but a maximum in two other dimensions. Okay, he says that's what defines a bond. So this looks okay. It's a, a little, look at this picture again. Now I want you to look at the lines. This is the lines, the little black lines, which are hard to see, are what the quantum theory of atoms and molecules tells you the bonds are. Those lines, those are bond paths. Notice there is no bond line from that oxygen to that carbon. There is no line here. There is a line from that oxygen only to the carbon is, it looks at this point like everything's making sense. But it gets into trouble. Well, so here is a picture, for instance, of phenanthrene, phenanthrene and biphenyl. And in these pictures, uh, the red dot, this shows the bond paths, which are the li yellow lines. The bond critical point is the little red point. And what you see is everything in most of the molecule is exactly as you imagine it should be, except between those two hydrogens, there is a bond path and there is a bond critical point between the two hydrogens. The same between biphenyl, those two hydrogens, in a planar conformation. Uh, that is in trouble because every organic chemist knows that those positions of a height on a phenanthrene and those positions on a biphenyl are hysterically hindered. Okay, so what the heck does the chemist mean by hysterically hindered? So I'll tell you what they mean. They mean that if I put methyl groups instead of hydrogens there, I have trouble putting them in. And there are signs that the methyl groups repel each other in the crystal structure. And I cannot put two T-butyl groups there. That is the chemist translates that into the thing that the organic chemist is a master of doing, which is of making molecules. The same over here. If you put bulky groups over here, they move away from each other. So Bader's mistake was he tried to, um, to get out of this by postulating an attraction between those hydrogens and that it's just not there in a, in a sense that we normally think about it. it no, no chemical consequences. Here is uh, the real sort of reductio ad absurdum, which made people wonder. This is Buckminster Fullerene, a wonderful molecule, stable as a rock. Here's a bond critical point at the midpoint of every CC bond of the molecule. And from the, and this is a um, helium atom trapped in C60. Now, it turns out you can make this. You make this by heating the hell out of Buckminster Fullerene in a helium atmosphere. And in pops a helium and the cage closes up again. Um, you can know it's there by doing a helium isotope NMR on it. So actually, one knows this is there aside from the mass spectrum. 
And when you do a calculation on this, between the helium atom and every one of the 60 carbons of the Buckminster fullerene is a bond path and a bond critical point. Now, you can make a story around here, but telling a chemist that there are 60 helium carbon bonds here is not going to sell. This index has no chemical sense. And it's in fact a consequence just of the topology. Now there are, um, there are things that you can, you find that you, there are other indicators. It turns out that if you look at the second derivative of the electron density, the Laplacian, then uh, that measures the balance between uh, kinetic and potential energy densities at the bond critical point. And this, and when this is negative, one typically has a covalent bond and positive L, which is what would happen for that helium and C60, uh, you would get your repulsion. There are other measures uh, which are a little bit better, but the simple bond analysis is, an, is a problem. Okay, now I'll say something more in just a moment. Let me talk about electron localization function. The electron localization function due to Becky and Edgecombe about 30 years ago is a measure, it, it's something which was, is based on a very good idea. The very good idea is that the basic characteristic of a bond is that there are two electrons in it of opposite spin. So what they wanted was to find a measure of places in the molecule where there are two electrons of opposite spin. Turns out that it's difficult to calculate that. So they instead focused on something different, which is they made the supposition that the place where there's a lot of electrons of opposite spin will be places where there is little electrons of the same spin. And so they, Turns out that's easier to calculate. It's not that easy for some things, but easier. And they then devised a measure which was designed to go between zero and one. The zero, this form of this is only to make it come out between zero and one. Don't worry about the form. But into it goes an F of R. This F of R is it's complicated. It's the curvature, which means the second derivative of the pair probability function of electrons of the same spin. And then it had to be made relative to something. So they made it relative to a very unchemical thing and hoped that chemists wouldn't notice. Uh, and that is they, they made it a free uh, relative to a free electron gas. This has been modified later, but, but let me translate this into English. F of R is large where you have a lot of electrons of the same spin, a region of space where you have a lot of electrons of the same. F, is, F of R is small when you have a, a small number of this, therefore a large number of this. That's the reason. Okay. Incidentally, if you get in your hands someone who's willing to answer questions while they show you many elves, just ask them innocently, what does elf mean? And you, you'll see whether they understand or not this. Um, okay. so. Uh, they didn't calculate it for some simple molecules. Whenever I see an index, a measure of anything, I'm a chemist. I'm, I'm, a, chem I'm, a, theor I'm a chemist hiding as a theoretician. I'm a chemist. 
So I know how things are. When somebody's going to show me some index of a bond, which tells me that it has a lot, a big value when there is a pair of electrons of opposite spin, I think of lone pairs and bonds. That's what I think of. So uh, you might think that they would immediately apply it in the first paper to water and ammonia. No, they're not going to do it. Someone else had to do it. Burdett and McCormick quickly applied this L function to ammonia and water. And here it is for water in upper left and ammonia next to it. And you see these are contours of a high value of L approaching one. And what you see is a lone pair. The other place where there are high values is in, in a cores. Two, a 1s orbital has two electrons. Uh, the kinetic energy wins out. Um, here are the two lone pairs of water. Here is the one lone pair of ammonia. And the, the weird thing is the CH bonds. The ELF basins for CH bonds look like big balloons. And I don't understand why, but those are the regions where there is a high probability of finding two electrons. I understand why you have to go far out because then the, the two electrons are not squeezed together that, that are of opposite spin. But why they're so polarized toward the hydrogen, I'm not sure. Next to it here, this will help also. This, I'm trying to convince you of the normality of ELF, of why it's of value, okay? So this is cyclohexane. I bet you didn't think of cyclohexane this way, but this is cyclohexane. And the little green regions are the CC bonds in L. And the blue balloons are each of the hydrogens. Yeah. This is cyclopropane next to it. Look at that. You see the balloons for the hydrogens, and then you see the CC bond region and before your eyes, you see a bent bond. Just what organic chemists would tell you, that the bonds in cyclopropane are not along the lines, but bent out a little bit. Interesting. Here is acetylene in an ELF map. H, C, C, H. Two balloons for the hydrogens. We're getting used to those. A torus, what is going on there? So what's happening there, it's not seeing the sigma bond. The sigma bond doesn't localize very well, but the pi bonds are pretty localized. And since the two pi bonds are orthogonal to each other, they give a cylinder. That's the torus, that's the pi bond. And the little red areas are the inner cores. So you have to get used to them, but it's not bad. Uh, there is recently another indicator called Ellie, uh, which is the same thing restricted in the region. Here's an Ellie for acetylene. Whenever somebody gives you a bond indicator, if it's, if it's a matter of pushing a button in a program, the first advice to, to your students is, for God's sakes, try it out on a molecule, you know what it should come out. Okay, so that's what I'm doing. Uh, and this is acetylene and that those hydrogen balloons are weird, but the rest of it, I, I begin to understand. So what shall we do with these two theories, ELF and QTAAM? Oh, so I've written an article yes, why people accept theories. That's Professor, the let, let me just make a question, please. Yes. With, with those models, is it possible to identify double bonds, triple bonds, or just not, there is a bond? Not in these models. You cannot identify this, the double trip. You cannot identify, as okay. far as I know. Thank you. OK. So why should one accept these theories? Um, 
I think theories, the usual thing is people accept theories because they explain better or more of what is known. They fit with known theories. We don't expect one theory to expect to, to work for everything. And also what makes people accept theories is that they make uh, verifiable and preferably risky prediction. What's a risky prediction? A risky prediction is if you convene ninety percent of if you convene convene the experts in the field and and ninety percent of the experts vote that a certain predicted outcome is wrong. If it comes out right, that's a risky theory. Uh, that's a risky prediction. Uh, that's what happened with Einstein's prediction of the advancement of the perihelion of Mercury. It was, it was the reasons were not known. There are other reasons why people accept theories and they are very important. One is aesthetic reasons and foremost in them is simplicity. So I can say this in a number of ways, but let me try to say it in, in, in uh, we fall for simplicity every time. Or to put it another way, we think the universe is as simple as our minds are. There are many different ways. And Einstein said it right. He said the universe is as complex as it has to be in order to be what it is. Uh, and simplicity and the idea, especially of beautiful equations, is, is a real danger. Uh, symmetry also is a danger. Um, so, um, why is water bent? Why isn't it linear? Wouldn't the world be nicer if water were linear? Um, well, it isn't, and so on. There are other reasons why people accept theories. One is they tell a good story. And this is sometimes good, sometimes bad, um, but the story, the narrative structure of theories is very important that they form frameworks of understanding, that they can encompass a number of things. A very controversial thing is uh, social needs of a community. The theories reflect, um, reflect things which are not just about facts, but which are about what the world wants and what the world wants at any time is, uh, is what it gets. Evelyn Fox Keller uh, in Making Sense of Life says this in some detail. Let me summarize it in a sentence. The gentlemen of the Royal Society and the French Academy of Sciences, wonderful scientists all in 1800, would not believe that a woman, an Asian, a Jew or a black would be able to do science. What was their reason for their not thinking this? It was the community around them. And how many other things are still buried in our community, even as we think we have come wider? Um, and of course they were wrong. There are other things about theory, acceptance of theories. I believe the theories that are portable that you can give to somebody else are better accepted than theories which are private or which you require a certain person. Um, this is very hard for theoreticians to understand. That if you give away a theory to somebody, that's what makes your theory valuable. That somebody else can use it. That it's teachable. There are any number of ways to say this. Productive means that it suggests experiments. My personal opinion is that quantum theory of atoms and molecules is beautiful, analytical, and descriptive. It is not predictive nor productive. And as such, it is not inherently chemical and of value to chemists. It is a way of analyzing the electron density. Elf. I think is a little better. It can lead to some productive insights. And I mentioned the solid state work of Yuri Green. 
I think it's a little bit better, but it's still very unchemical at some level and has to be used uh, with caution along with other things. Okay, I've not left myself enough time for natural bond orbitals and other things. Natural bond orbitals is an analysis due to Weinhold. Uh, again, there's a book on it. Uh, there is a complex series of transformations of the wave function to form natural orbitals. Um, and there are several matrix diagonalizations along the way. There are a lot of hidden assumptions uh, for if there are any organometallic chemists in the audience. One of the hidden assumptions in the application of natural orbitals to inorganic compounds is for transition metals, they begin with a built-in assumption that uh, P orbitals on the metal are somehow not in the basis set. And so at the end of it, they come out that P orbitals are not important in the bonding. So, but I think it's built into the theory in some way. Um, it's, it gives things that are very chemical and it gives reasonable charges, especially, which is interesting, a little bit exaggerated. Here's example, methylamine, CH3, NH2, done with uh, Weinhold scheme. You get a, a lower left, you get a bond orbital for the CN bond, sigma bond, you get an anti-bonding orbital looking just like what you think. This is a contour of electron density. And then you get to form those bonds, you get you can form hybrids in this method. There is a hybrid on the nitrogen, there is a hybrid on the carbon. You form this bond from these. It's a very chemical picture. You get a negative charge on the carbon, a positive charge on hydrogen negative charge on the carbon here, but less than on the nitrogen because some electron density is stolen. The charges seem reasonable, somewhat exaggerated. You see the hydrogens here? They are too positive, I think. Um, it's not, it's a very chemical picture. And one interesting thing about it, it has a perturbation theory attached to it. So you can uh, analyze interactions. I, I would recommend this method in general, but just applies with some caution. Energy decomposition analysis goes back to Morokuma and then eventually in the hands of Behrens and Pickelhaupt has become formalized in the ADF, the Amsterdam Density Functional Programs, and um, has uh, been used in a number of ways. Also, uh, Franking has popularized this a lot. Let me show you a little bit from Franking's work. The general idea is simple, and that is that somehow the total energy of a molecule, and don't pay any attention to these, in fact, I'm not going to show it. Um, the general idea is that somehow the total energy of the molecule with all the terms in the Hamiltonian, the kinetic energy, the potential energy, everything else can be decomposed into atomic compositions, into atomic contributions, and then their interaction. And that decomposition proceeds <coughs> in several steps where the, for, there's a first step where the fragments of the molecule are prepared for bonding. So if you are trying to calculate how two methyl groups bond in ethane, you first take a CH3 and you distort it to be pyramidal. Okay, that requires certain energy. Then you are prepared. And once you do this, you calculate first the electrostatic interaction of the pluses and minuses over here with the ones on the other atom, quantum mechanically. You then calculate also the Pauli repulsion of the electron densities here to the, for the next one. 
This is actually the term that's analogous to the four electron repulsions in the simplified ML theory. Uh, and then all, you have finally an orbital interaction where filled orbitals of one fragment interact with unfilled orbitals of the other fragment. That's the interaction, that's the orbital part. I mean, it's easier, it's easier to get a feeling for this by seeing what happens. So here is Franking analyzing ethane, ethylene, acetylene by making them from their fragments. Two CH3s, two CH2s, two CHs, okay? The interaction energy, here it is, I think, I don't even know what units this is. If it's, if it's, I think it's kilojoules. Um, no, it must be kilocalories because the association energy. It's in kilocalories. Um, you see the interaction energy of two CHs is bigger than two C2H4, CH2s and two methyls. Okay, now he analyzes that and he gets the poly interaction is always repulsive. The orbitals of electrons in these orbitals always repel the electrons in these orbitals as if you analyze it in this, in this way, by, by making the wave function anti-symmetric. The electrostatics is always negative, And the sum of the two is always slightly pos somewhat positive. And then the orbital interaction, you remember that, you remember the numbers here initially for the interaction of the two fragments, the energy, there are, there are too many significant figures on all of these numbers, it's terrible. Uh, one should teach a course about how theoretical chemists should learn that in the number of significant figures, more is less. Meaning the more figures you give, the less is someone likely to interpret it. Um, so um, you notice the interaction energies goes minus 100, minus 190, minus 280. They increase in the fragments. The orbital energies are also going like that, increasing by 100 for each, as you see here. And you can partition this into a sigma and pi. And you notice the ethane has no sigma, no pi, but ethylene has 79 kilocalories of a pi, and acetylene has twice as much, not quite, but in that direction. Uh, and uh, the sigmas, on the other hand, are the same. Let me summarize this for you, and you can check it against your experience. In every case of chemical significance I know, the total energy of interaction goes like the orbital interaction energy in, a, in this partitioning. That is what you see up there is the way that this goes. The numbers are different. Usually there is repulsion to, to lessen the orbital energy, but it's in that direction. Okay, I have now done these things and it looks like I have come to this situation. That is, I've come to a situation of thoroughly confusing you, except for some strong opinions about QTAAM and ELF. Uh, which you can argue with me. And if Richard Bader were alive, he would argue with me very vociferously. Um, but basically, uh, it looks like there are several different ways of interpreting the bonding in these. And I've tried to be fair, uh, but th there are, but I, I am, I am driven by my prejudice. So I want to now, I also, even though I've tried to be fair, I think there should be little doubt in your mind about what I believe. And what I believe is that simple 
orbital interactions can get you most of the way on analyzing bonding. And I will um, tell you what I mean by that or try to make a case for that on this one molecule that I showed you before, C2. Here are all these potential energy curves. And we know the ground state, and there's a big debate, as you have seen, on whether this ground state, with its bond lengths of 1.24, that puts it pretty close to an acetylene, a little longer than acetylene CC, whether this bond here is a quadruple bond or something closer to a double bond. A number of papers have been done about this, but I'm interested more, let's see. I think chemistry is about transformation. I think the interaction of theoretical chemists with chemists is most productive when we talk about things you can change, that's transformation. So what interests me or what my focus comes to mind and what I'm, the picture I'm going to give you gives is the change that makes for the difference, that makes for the difference. I, I want you to notice something else. This is, this C2 molecule, is a microcosm of all of chemistry. If you think about CC distances in angstroms of CC bonds, single, double, triple, in the 500,000 organic compounds that contain them in the Cambridge structural file, you will get I didn't show you that, but you will get that the range of those bonds is between 1.20 for acetylenic type compounds to 1.54, as you saw for ethane. Everything is in there. What I want you to see is the C2 molecule in its ground and excited states is playing out the full range of CC bonding in any molecule. So if I understand this, there is a sign that I can understand the other ones too. So now go back to, let's go back to high school and graduate school. This is the bonding for C2 at a high school level. 2S in phase, out of phase, 2P sigma, 2P pi, pi stars, sigma star. I mix in, S and P through second order perturbation theory, I would say. Some would, might say it another way. And you get the lowest sigma G is bonding, the upper sigma G becomes a lone pair combination. Okay, so I can assign a bonding character to these. And what I want to tell you is that qualitative picture is. I would claim much more powerful than any bond index you use to quantify it. Because in that qualitative picture is where understanding resides. The numbers are what the numbers will be according to the various measures. And if you calculate the bond index with Levdeen population analysis, you will get a different number from a Mulliken population analysis. But that this will be large and this will be small, that will not differ. You will just have to push me on what large and small is, but, but that it is that is where understanding resides. So what are the different states of C2. Well, the ground state has, remember this, usually when we tell students about this, we tell them about N2. N2 has 10 valence electrons. This, this, these two, and this is filled. So N2 is filled through the two sigma G. And N2 has a triple bond 
Where is the triple bond? Here is the sigma component. Here is the pi component. N2 has two lone pairs. I'm asking you to draw a lower structure in your head for N2. Here is one lone pair combination. Here is the other lone pair combination. What is the first orbital that you ionize out of N2? It's the two sigma G with the lone pair combination. What are the bonding characteristics? Very bonding, slightly anti-bonding, bonding substantially and slightly bonding. Here is the ground state of C2. Okay, now switch your thinking from N2 to C2. There's two less electrons. Uh, it turns out that this electron is vacated, the two sigma G. So the pi U is the ground state, but as you can see from this picture, that pi U is not that far below the sigma G. So that a triplet with three electrons in pi U and one in sigma G, sorry, is actually competing to be the ground state and is only half an EV above or less actually, I think. But when I promote an electron from a very bonding orbital to a slightly bonding one, okay? Am I going to lengthen the bond or, or shorten it? I'm going to lengthen the bond a little bit, losing some bonding. And the bond lengths in that one, they're over these two states over here are a little longer. If I promote two electrons to sigma G from this one to that one, I will lengthen it more. I can make sense out of every equilibrium bond length qualitatively by this kind of bonding argument. Let me in particular try the hard one. How do I get a bond length that's shorter in the ground state than in, that's shorter in an excited state than it is in a ground state? That's this, this minimum here. How can I get that? What I need to do is to take an electron out of a, slightly anti-bonding orbital and to put it into a slightly bonding one. That's all I have to do. I understand that. I can understand the very long bonds. I can understand the short ones, not quantitatively, or I, I have faith my colleagues will get it right for these curves, but I qualitatively, I am very happy. I have made sense of a lot of chemistry. And that C2 is not only there in, in, this, in this molecule in a vapor phase. Let me show you some molecules we don't tell our first year students about. There are molecules like uh, erbium-10, ruthenium-10, C19, or uranium-2, chromium-2, C5. All of them have C2 units in it. Here is a structure of one of them, a simple one. Uh, sometimes we tell students about calcium carbide. Calcium carbide is a rock salt structure of calcium two pluses and C22 two two minuses with an acetylenic bond length. But these molecules, here's one of them. Here's, it has a layer of dysprosiums and then a layer of cobalt carbide, an organometallic polymer which has C2 units, which are pi bonded to one cobalt and di sigma bonded to two other cobalts in blue. And that C2 unit has a bond length of 1.36, dysprosium cobalt cover, sorry. That's not quite right here, this 1.366 from an X-ray structure. And how do I make sense of that? Of course, I'm going to make sense of this by doing a band structure calculation, this is a three-dimensional material. I know how to do band structures and I've taught chemists how to do it. Um, 
I'm going to do a band calculation. I'm going to look at the population of various C2 levels. C2 is a fragment. And I'm going to see which are occupied. It'll, it'll give me something approximately. C2, the world of C2, diatomic molecules, organic molecules, organometallic molecules. My colleague Pete Wolzanski has made a C2 trap between two um, between two titaniums, I think, here, and uh, siloxy groups. Here's a C2 being attacked by four ruthenians. Here's a C2 inside a polyhedron of calciums and nickels. Here is um, a C2 on a surface of silver 100. Zero, zero. Uh, this is spectroscopy, that's organic chemistry, that's organometallic. This is solid state, this is surface chemistry. The molecule is trying to tell us something. It's trying to tell us something that you guys can call yourself whatever you want. There is one chemistry under all this. And it's time to see that one chemistry. And a fragment way is not a bad way. So I now come to the end of the story. Um, I wanted to get in my way. I think the simple MOA is still a reasonable way to especially look at how the reasonably persistent connection between atoms that is a bond measured in a number of theoretical ways, a number of experimental ways, how it can be varied and be of use to chemists. Um, I've shown you, it, it took me two and a half hours, um, but I was able to go through many of the things that chemists use. Um, it, the discussion continues, and uh, when you distribute the PDF, you can get some of these uh, more recent discussions of covalent bonding by people I respect uh, and admire, in fact. But I want to come with my uh, end view, which is part of a general worldview of chemistry. Um, I think um, that any rigorous definition of a chemical bond is, if you think about it, that by itself is just as productive as calling one human being white and another human being black, that you have a bond or no bond. It's it leaves one with the comfortable feeling, yes, I have a bond, I do not have a bond. <sighs> but what else does it tell you? And yet this bond is very important. It's important. Uh, it has a history, has a life, it generates controversy. Look at discussions to this day about hydrogen bonding, about uh, sigma holes, about other things. And also, it, it's interesting that it has these different things. From time to time, there come up people from physics who thinks they can give us the answers, that you stupid chemists just haven't found the right way to define a bomb. Well, it's okay. I, I'm used to that because I move in both worlds, but I, uh, I can if, I, if they give me the time, I can show them the full beauty and what the problem is in these definitions. My advice is always be aware of the different criteria and accept at the limits that a bond will be a bond by some criteria and maybe not in others. And in fact, I would say, Look for those borderlines and especially think about how you can manipulate it. Just respect the idea that this is not that carefully defined and that it has various manifestations. As you, I know it's hard to be aware of all of them, but 
calculate the bonding in a number of ways if you're a calculator. If you're an experimentalist, express some due skepticism about some of the theoretical methods and always ask the question, how can I change it? How can I probe my understanding by changing it? Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ward. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. Thank you. Well, I have been waiting for asking you two questions from the people in YouTube. Sure. Okay. So the first here. one is from, uh, let me see, Eduardo. Eduardo says, hello, Professor Hoffman. Do you believe the secret of supercon superconductivity in room temperature could be hiding in some place in chemical bonds? So, um, uh, as, as many of you know, I have been working close to the border of chemistry and physics for the last 25 years and for the last 10, 15 on materials under high pressure, which is where some of the new high temperature superconductors have come from. Um, I have studied superconductivity. Uh, I would, I have understood a part of it and I'm, I think that a part of the theory of superconductivity leads one to think, this is from a point of view that the, the superconducting pairs of a BCS model are, can be thought of as being correlated over very long distances, nothing like a chemical distance. Part of the theory of superconductivity leads you to think that you will not find a chemical, uh, exp chemical explanation or method. I, uh, maybe it's naive, but I, I believe that you can find one. And I think it, that you can find a chemical approach and it will be based on a good physical chemical understanding of electron phonon coupling so that a, a phonon is just another word for molecular vibrations um, so that understanding how electronic structure changes with vibrations and visualizing it could lead to a chemical theory of superconductivity i've i've felt close to it in my later years of activity, but I didn't get to it. I didn't, I couldn't see. And I say I didn't get to it. Uh, as you know, um, first of all, if I got to it, you would hear about it because I love to write papers and I've written 650 of them. <laughs> Second, I like to teach. So the moment I understand it, you will understand it because that's what I am. I'm a teacher. Um, so um, I just haven't gotten to it. I haven't gotten it in a shape that is tangible that I can teach to you uh, or that I understand. I think a chemical theory of superconductivity, meaning that you could predict the elements and the stoichiometry of the next superconductor. That is a reasonable one, maybe not the TC, but that it should have a high, I think, high TC. I think that that is within the reach of chemists. And I think it's not that far away from us, but I will not be the one who gets it. <laughs> Thank you. There is there is a other one. In the energy decomposition analysis, 
you showed, the Pauling term is repulsive. Yes. But if you look at things from the quantum theory atom in molecules perspective, the Pauling terms is attractive. Do you have some thoughts on this? Um, I think they just have different ways of defining what is the Pauli term. The, the Pauli term in, in uh, the uh, fragment analysis is defined as what you get after anti-symmetrizing the wave function properly for the two fragments. That is, um, and that, I think that the, there's a different definition of what the Pauli term is in uh, QTAAM and the fragment analysis. I'm just not well enough up on these to, to be able to explain it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just uh, now is a personal question. Sometimes I see that the uh, students want to run the most accurate calculations from scratch. The first thing they try to do is to run the highest level calculation. And uh, sometimes I think that it's better to start with a lower level method, try to understand the chemistry, and then if necessary, go goes to a higher level. Do you agree with this strategy? Yes. Oh, sure. And also model or toy systems are immensely useful. You can see the utility of a harmonic oscillator for uh, as a model system for molecular vibrations, and then to introduce anharmonicity. But the, the most fundamental and basic model system for underlying chemistry is the particle in a box. And that toy system, elementary system of quantum mechanics, um, which can be then modified by perturbations or by having several boxes, but that the ideas of, um, uh, of the levels of a particle in a box that the number of nodes increases as you go up in energy, that idea is there throughout all of chemistry. Um, and it, you can model a diatomic molecule by a particle in a rectangular box and you get, mm -hmm. you get things pretty well. You can model the orbitals of a polyene, the pi orbitals now, by a particle in a box. Um, anyway, I, uh, I think I, if I examine what was, why did I get so much chemistry out of a bad theory in the first 15 years of my life, of my before I started doing all electron calculations or 20, 25 years, I did extended Hickel calculations, mm -hmm. which are just molecular orbital calculations with an extended basis set. And I had the base, but what I had was a simple model where, whose conclusions were sometimes right, sometimes not. But I had the explanations for what levels did in terms of which levels interacted and how they interacted were amenable to a simple perturbation theory analysis, which could be formalized. And I immediately translated it from equations to words. Mm -hmm. And that's what made it teachable to other organic chemists. Whereas the people who stuck with the equations had more trouble teaching the things. They had the same things, but that the two levels mix, that the lower one has no nodes and the upper one takes the node, 
that the lower one mixes in the upper one in a bonding way, whereas the upper one mixes the lower one in an anti-bonding way. Um, these were such, there, there is a perturbation theory basis, but somehow I could play with it. So the other thing that I would advise students, I, I've already said it in some way, when they are given a simple model, which may mean for organic chemists, uh, some software like Spark or some minimal basis set, ab initio calculation or DFT. The first thing you should do is get yourself in a frame of mind where A, you do things that you know. I've already said that a few times. Mm -hmm. And second, play with it. Play. You've been given a toy. It doesn't cost much to do another calculation. So test your, use the playing, meaning do another system. If you've done H3, do H4. If you've done a ring, distort the ring. The playing is for a purpose. The purpose is to sharpen your skills for understanding why the calculations as perturbed by you as a result of the game are coming out the way that they are. That playing the game builds your, it gets you no science necessarily, but it builds your confidence in your ability to understand the calculation so that the calculation is not a deus ex machina that gives you a number but mm -hmm. is something which reflects what you do to nature in the perturbation. Okay. There is another question here, let me see. Oh, it's uh, from my friend, Antonio Carlos Pavon. Hello, Antonio. <laughs> Pavon said, dear Juan, great to see you. I heard you said, if you want certainty in your life, go to math. Does it mean ab abandoning the desire or illusion of finding the theorems of chemistry? <laughs> yes. Yes, so uh, where that <clears throat> phrase, the theorems of chemistry comes is in part from that wonderful book by Primo Levi, The Periodic Table. And in one chapter at the end of his education, He's disillusioned with the analytical chemistry he has learned. And, and he asks, where are the theorems of chemistry? And it's a question that young people who are mathematically minded often ask. Also, um, the ability for science at the initial levels is often revealed by the ability to do mathematics. I'm thinking now of elementary school levels. And so there comes a, a what I would claim, a, a not, not a false alley, but a, a little bit um, something that misguides you that, that the, the numeric is the absolute and the algebraic and geometrical are its are certain manifestations of it. But I, I think that theorems, it's such a satisfaction when a theorem, when you can prove a theorem in the classical way of Euclid. Oh. And chemistry is not like that. And what I always want people to say is, Look, you have proven in your relationship with your parents and siblings and teachers that people are not theorems. And furthermore, that knowing what people are like, who they are, is a process of 
admitting more and more complexity. That complexity is interesting. It's inherently human. It's not reductionist. So I would say really that molecules are like human beings, or I would like to move in that direction rather than the direction of theorems. And yet we have these ways of understanding this world. It's natural we try to understand it. But yes, I've given up on complete understanding. Thank you. So I would like to be with you for the rest of the day, but I think it's time for the I last. Think it's time. <laughs> it's time. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Just one, uh, the last question. This is just a curiosity. Uh, is Michael who, who is asking? What has inspired you to become a poet? And how hard or easy was it compared to chemistry? Uh, so what inspired me was a course at the university in poetry. Um, and uh, a teacher, Mark Van Doren, a poet himself, uh, who taught me how to read a poem and taught me the power of words and resonances and alternative meanings. Um, and that just seemed to me so wonderful. It also seemed that it was within reach that I could do it. <laughs> I, I worry about music and mathematics because those seem to require talent. Chemistry didn't require any talent. And poetry, anyone can write, and people do. Or at least I could. For, uh, with time, I became good at words, and that's certain. Uh, it is more difficult. I am I'm a good chemist. I'm an uh, average poet. Um, it does not come easily, but when it comes and I have persisted in it, and I have, of course, tried to publish, maybe carrying over what I did from the science, but also I, I want to share it with people. It's been wonderful to see the power and the ambiguity of words. Nice. Thank, you. Thank you. And there are other people here. Thank you, thank, thank you because you have inspired them when they were selecting the field to study. So some of our friends here say that they decided to go to chemistry because of your work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very all. much. And you will distribute the PDF if, if anybody wants it. Okay, I will do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. It was a honor. Thank you.